sort of observed about a lot of the coverage of Facebook and the response to it is that um, it's often described as people, by people in Silicon Valley and Facebook as a tech clash that's driven by cynical journalists who are looking for page views and they maybe are even bitter over disintermediation that Facebook has done, you know, between you know their audience and their product. But when I read um, the Nobel Lectures recently, I was struck by a uh, passage in the acknowledgments at the end of the book, and, it, and I'm just going to read it really quickly. It just said, this book would not have been possible without the many sources who trusted us to tell their stories. They spoke to us at great personal and professional risk, and we are so grateful for their participation, patience, and commitment to the pursuit of truth. While some have since left Facebook, many remain at the company and are trying to change things from within. They said this book is 400 people, and obviously Francis Howard is a Facebook employee. So all of this makes me wonder and really think, what, why are people feeling like they need to risk their careers in order to challenge what the company is trying to do? Um, you know, employees, not journalists, are in fact leading this sort of rebellion or revolt against one person, Mark Zuckerberg. What do you say to these employees who are speaking to journalists and trying to get effect change this way? I mean, I think so many people come to the company, and a lot of these folks are folks I've uh, worked with for over a decade, um, come into the company to work on very specific social issues. You have folks come in who spend their entire life working on protecting elections. Um, you have folks come in who spend their entire life studying very specifically polarization in every context in the world, the world the internet has to play. We want employees who care about having a social impact, who care about making sure that the internet is as good as possible as it can be, you know, for us and for uh, for society. And so I think the most important message we have for those employees is your work is important. And that's why we've been asking so much in it over the years. So would you ever be a whistleblower or a source for journalism that's critical of how your friend Mark Zuckerberg is running Facebook? And what kind of line would he or the company have to cross for you to do that sort of thing? Well, I'm perfectly happy talking to journalists, which is what I'm doing today. I think it's, look, I think it's good that we're having this conversation out in public. I think it's important that the leaders of these groups are talking to, to the media, to the public, directly, in, in, in forums like this. I mean, this is not going to be easy, and it should be. And I think for that reason, um, it's even more important right now that you have us out having these conversations. Not about all of the issues at once, I think importantly, we need to talk about each issue in turn. And we kind of need to move beyond soundbite land, and we need to get into the science of this stuff. And, and I'm, I'm saying that quite seriously, um, that for each of these uh, questions, what, what is hate speech on the internet? What is an acceptable amount of it? How does it play out throughout various regions? When does it lead to violence? When is it, uh, when is it, you know, good free speech and civic discourse? These are like timeless questions. And for each of them, there is not always a perfect answer, but there is an answer that has transparency around it, that has enforcement around it, that can be audited, that can be blessed by lawmakers and third parties. Those are the zones that we hope to see the company get to over the coming years, not just alone, but with the industry at large and increasingly with lawmakers. Does it make your life more difficult that one person has so much control over the company and everyone knows it and sort of that's the fallback backstop for any major decision? I, I think one of the things that we believe as a company is that devolving power is important. And this takes place in every sort of level of the, of the company. I mean, at the user interface level, it's giving people more controls over the experience they have. This is something that broadly, generally, people love and appreciate and is helpful. Um, at the level of governance, this is why we set up the oversight board, um, which is one sort of first version of trying to get into something more like a Supreme Court which is an audited, published set of deliberations around decisions which become canon for the really, really, really hard set of um, calls that need to get made around the intersection of free speech and safety. Um, that's the kind of thing that I think we need to do, which is about giving power 
it to other bodies, um, to other institutions, to create some sort of checks and balances. And that's also why we've been calling for regulation, um, specifically around areas of enforcement of um, content standards, where it would be good to have these um, established and recognized law. Let's roll some video of our, a meeting you and I had in the metaverse uh, somewhat recently. I think it was last week. So, so can, while that gets queued up, could you just tell us, what is the metaverse? I mean, it's something we've been talking about since the 90s in the industry. Um, Sci-fi readers understand this. And uh, I think the easiest way to think about it is the internet becomes less flat. Uh, we've gotten used to um, computers in our pockets, <laughs> and we're still sort of looking at each other through screens and typing to each other a lot of the time. Uh, the history of computing has this getting more immersive. That's, that's happened over the last several decades. And I think where this leads us, you know, in the next time period is where we're not looking at each other through tiny boxes and we're starting to have a feeling of presence. Do you, so, it's cool. Let me start by saying that. You're in there, it's very immersive, it feels, it tricks your brain very effectively. But do you think that people are going to really have serious conversations in an environment where everyone looks like a cartoon? It's not going to start um, with the most serious conversations in the most cartoon format. But let's remember, technology starts in lower resolution versions of what it becomes. I mean, you don't get to the iPhone until you go through the Newton and the Palm and the Blackberry. And I think if you look at where VR is now, I mean, Oprah just put it on her like best items for 2021 list. It's gotten to a place where for broad consumers, you have a product that's really fun. Um, I started having my staff meetings in, in workrooms, which we're using here in Nicholas. And the reason that it's better for us than a video conference is that you get to see body language and you get the spatial audio, which means you can talk over each other. You can use your hands, which is a huge part of how you communicate. And then you can lean in and sort of like change your attention based on posture, which is a lot of how we have a meeting with the group. Those things, and keep in mind we're in V1, the hardware is improving quickly, the field of view is improving, the resolution is improving. We have folks from uh, Industrial Light and Magic who spend a lot of their lives thinking about animation, posture, and gaze, working on the next generation of this stuff. Um, it's not for everybody today, but we are finding it really exciting as part of the early experiences, and it's gotten to be quite good. So have you ever given anyone like critical feedback in a conference, you know, a staff meeting is like, listen, we can't yeah, really yeah, visit it. Yeah, I mean, my team meetings are in Monday, they're pretty honest. And um, this is just my direct staff. And yeah, I mean, there's a lot of blood feedback being given. It's not like your performance review, <laughs> but um, I think people in every, in some way or another, people are exhausted by video conferencing. Um, the fact that you don't know who's looking at whom is just not how we're designed to, to understand attention. Um, the fact that we're all constantly interrupting each other on a, a very on a mono channel is really not good for groups. And there's a whole bunch of other things that are just kind of weird about it. It's better than not being together. But um, it's definitely not how this is going to work in 30 years. And so then the question is just, what is the bridge from here to there? Does and it, does, um, does it, it matter that, 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 sorry to interrupt, but just does it matter that, you know, in my office, I'm trying this on, I have a glass mirror, glass window in my conference room where I was doing this. I can hear people laughing at me, you know? It looks silly, it's a cartoon. You know, yes, that's what it is. It's easy to get there, but how do you get over Remember the Remember this? Remember Clueless, where everybody's laughing at her cell phone? Sure. Like, and that's where it's class just... as well, and, and I just... Well, yeah, and, and you know, there's, there's always a few attempts that are too soon. Um, on every technology we've ever built, it starts, it's a little awkward, we don't totally understand it, we don't get everything right. We, the industry, 
but there is a progression of these things that I think has to ask the question, like, is the video conference where it ends for how a group gets together? And I think the answer is no. And then the question is, okay, <laughs> what's missing? And then I think you get in all these very like user-centric, human-centric questions of how we communicate. Try, try to paint a picture for us because I think what's happening is people hear like the big, one of the biggest, most powerful companies in the world saying, this is the future. And they see this cartoon world with no legs and, they, and they're looking for a there there. And they see this. Is there another there there that you could paint for us? Like a, like a picture that's slightly more like, just to be very, give you some candid feedback. People see this and they laugh a little bit, and so they don't, they hate video conferencing, but they think this will be worse. And, and so, what is it there, there, that's an even more, like something just to hang on? Hey, 40,000 people here, they want a picture, paint it for them. Well, I think I'll just say that the, the user feedback and the customer feedback around VR is far from what we're saying at all. I mean, people love the device, it's, it's easy to use, it can be incredibly fun including for things like exercise, which is a category that we didn't anticipate four or five years ago. You're seeing serious investment in that from game developers and content developers. And you're starting to see productivity be really good. One of the more compelling uh, experiences I had, I called my wife up here to sit down and try it out, is we had a comedy show in Horizon, which is a social platform we're building out. It was like an internal, you know, we had a, one of our engineers was a Moonlight is a stand-up comic. He came in and he prepared a team. We had 20 of us in the, in the room. Comedy is a good use case for this because watching comedy alone on a screen is like not getting the experience of being in a room with people laughing together. And he just being with coworkers or laughing at something together just felt really like you were finally starting to meet to the beginning of something new which is feeling like you're in a room with people that are hundreds or thousands of miles away. Um, I think for early adopters, this is already there. There is a hardest, excited, activated community of early adopters in VR. You have already, at scale, uh, communities like Roblox, which is essentially a, a UGC 3D world building experience that can be explored with your friends. Um, and I think if you pay attention to what's happening in there, it's very, very interesting. It's the I, kind of thing I that... Too, but I gotta get this last question in. Sorry, there's a little yeah. bit of lag. Yeah. Video conferencing problems, right? Um, so, <laughs> so, so, you know, like I said, mentioned before, people thought the Instagram acquisition was too expensive. They couldn't believe the price of WhatsApp. Facebook does things and then succeeds at it. So let's just for a moment imagine that I'm wrong and the cartoon world will take off and this is going to become a central part of our lives. It's going to be a place where we spend our lives, labor, leisure, you know, our wealth, our happiness, and are all dependent on this. If there's one thing that you tell people that will be more central to their lives, if they don't want Facebook to be more central to their lives. And that's because being central to their lives, things have gone wrong. And so how does Facebook think about the future success and what are you worried about? Like, so just to draw an analogy, a massive expansion into Myanmar, it's widely adopted in the country, only from what I've read, one or two people inside the company who speak the language of all the people using it there, you know, an underinvestment in, a, in, in what the company should have been worried about. Um, let's assume that, that just as bad things could happen now. What are you worried about? How are you not going to let another horrible situation develop because this succeeds so far past what you could even, um, even plan for now? Part of what we were trying to do here by starting this conversation with Tom <clears throat> about the metaverse is to have it industry-wide. We're not going to be the ones that build this alone. It's going to be something that emerges probably along the lines of the way the internet emerges. <clears throat> which is there's going to be a set of standards and protocols. There's going to be early experiences, and it's going to need to be done out of the open. I think that's a good thing. I think doing this now, um, beginning to fund, fund that we announced already, is a $50 million fund for two years to be spent in partnerships with um, civil rights organizations, academics, folks who can begin to study some of the unique benefits and the unique harms that immersive environments can bring to power. And starting to publish our results and starting to have those, um, starting to have that discourse happen in the public. 
I think that's a really good thing. Um, in some ways, a lot of what um, we see, you know, we've seen evolve with social media happened pretty quickly to a lot of people. It wasn't something the world was talking about super seriously in 2006. Most people thought we were a joke. Um, I think today we're in a really different position as an industry where regulators, academics, journalists, there are a lot more folks paying attention to and scrutinizing at the beginning, you know, the benefits and the harms. And I think that's, that's the best uh, thing that could possibly happen for a technology that over some time period will have a big impact on our lives. It should not replace real life. Nothing should. It will not. I certainly hope it will not, and I would not want to design something that does. But for things that it can improve upon computing, and take productivity, and take a family who can't be together, the things that we see billions of times a day around the world, and make that a little bit better, that's a big deal, and that's what we're doing. You know, a lot we're talking about a company, but we're also talking about a person. That person is Mark Zuckerberg, who controls 54% of the loading shares of Meta. And, you know, you are one of his oldest friends. He is someone who is in all of our lives and has a lot of influence on in how we live and our politics and our discourse. What is something that people, what do people get wrong about him and why should we feel comfortable with him having such an influence? Well, I think we, we talked about some of the key themes here. I mean, the first is his commitment to safety, um, as evidenced by the massive teams who've been working on these problems for over a decade, and a very serious investment of $5 billion a year. I think that's a big deal and shouldn't be discounted, especially in the narratives that suggest that he or us don't care. I think the other thing is his attention on the future is genuine and full of a deep-seated question about how do we build something some that's more interesting than this sort of um, peering through a box-based way we currently communicate. And I think that is a genuinely interesting question. Um, he's a builder at, at his core. I think a lot of us are. I think a lot of people in this audience are. And that means having the courage and the perseverance to get through the, the period where things are clunky. And sometimes it's a criteria. Um, and sort of try and see through that. Chris, uh, I think that's, that's. Oh, sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. Video I'm just saying, is yeah, the best ad for uh, getting past video conferences in Boston. I was going to say, I think it's a common theme of a lot of people It is. Okay, so Chris, thank you very much. Thank you for, for taking tough questions. And uh, we all appreciate it. So thanks, everyone, very much.